Uh, the first speaker is Dr. A. M. Chennai Appan from Trichy. His uh, topic is hypertension in the young. So may I request the chairpersons to just introduce briefly the speaker who is very much well known and needs no introduction. So I would like to request the chairperson to just initiate the next uh, deliberation. Dr. Chennaipan is a consultant, cardiologist attached to Apollo Specialty Hospital Strichi. He has many awards and accolades to his credit and uh, he is a teacher, renowned teacher and actually he is a teacher of teachers and he is a fellow of Royal College of Physicians, Glasgow, London, American College of Cardiology and the Indian uh, American College of Physicians. So may I request Dr. Chennaipan to start his deliberation. Thank you. Good evening all. Respect chairpersons. Uh, can I have my presentation to be shared? I thank uh, Dr. Jodhimai Paul for the wonderful opportunity of deliberating this very important topic uh, today. So my topic is going to be in on hypertension in young. So this is my plan of uh, deliberation that first of all, I define what we mean by hypertension in young. So first of all, we have to define who is young because at any age, we feel young, but according to the definition of hypertension, young, it is between 20 and 40 years. Hypertension is equal or more than 140, 90. In this uh, situation, we must also concentrate on high normal blood pressure which is 130 to 139 bar 85 to 89, because this high normal pressure we have to concentrate on, make sure that these people do not develop hypertension in future. So the job in our hands is that not only we treat hypertension, but also we must prevent hypertension. Hypertension in young is not rare. Only in adults, it's between 20 and 40 years may have hypertension as defined before. And it is likely to increase further because of the changing lifestyle, as well as changing the guidelines, gradually lowering the threshold of diagnosing hypertension. So some of the recent studies have shown it is 18% now. What is very important is to realize that the BP tracks strongly within the individuals. That means young hypertensive is going to become a hypertensive in the middle age and hypertension in elderly age. So the long-standing hypertension naturally going to produce a lot of target organ disease and complications. Most often it is not suspected and diagnosed and there is a lot of inertia in the uh, management of hypertension in the young. Why it is important? The presence of hypertension at young age between 20 to 40 years in case of risk of cardiovascular events such as early onset of coronary artery disease, heart failure, stroke and transient ischemic attacks in the middle age. So it predicts these, are, these complications are going to come. And many times the guidelines are as well as the risk estimation of the hypertension do not concentrate on these groups of between 20 and 40 years. Because many times the guidelines talk about hypertension above 40 years, many of the risk assessment scores also concentrate on 40 years and above. That's why it makes it more difficult to diagnose and treat hypertension in the young. Next, we come across when we answer what are the causes and how it is produced. So although we look at the common uh, risk factors for hypertension in the young, today the scenario is different. So this is a modern history taking in hypertension in the young. Whether your child is on 10th, 12th or appearing niche, or you're building a construction, how much you watch, a time you watch uh, television, how many, many times per week you eat outside. You have a teenager or unmarried daughter or sister in your house, or your doctor in private practice and running a private nursing home. Do you want a bicycle or a two-wheeler or a car? how much time you spend in the social media per day and how much time do you sleep in the night and how is your sleep and how much time you sit continuously per day. So rather than taking the conventional history here, these are the modern history taking in the treatment, in the diagnosis and the risk factors of hypertension young today in our day-to-day -day life. And of course, we have to always think of secondary causes in hypertension young. So the common secondary causes can be remembered with a mnemonic drop it. D for drugs and diet, R for renal, it can be renal parenchymal disease or renovascular disease, O for obstructive sleep apnea, primary hyperaldosteronomous is for P, and I stands for inequality of pulses, indicating coactation of iota and iota arteritis, and T for thyroid abnormalities. 
So these are the common secondary causes you must always think of whenever we come across hypertension in young. Surprisingly, we must realize the commonest secondary cause in hypertension in young is hypothyroidism. So, and followed by a renal vascular disease and renal insufficiency and primary hyperaldosteronism. All the other causes come later only. The renal vascular disease in the young is due to fibromuscular dysplasia. By fibromuscular dysplasia, if the patient is less than 30 years old, after 30 years old, the atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis may take over. So these are the causes and how it is produced. Then what type of hypertension we may have in young hypertensives? So in young hypertensive, diastolic hypertension strongly correlated with all-cause mortality than the systolic blood pressure with a risk rising substantially above 90 millimeters of mercury. In the elderly, we concentrate on systolic hypertension, whereas in the young, it is diastolic hypertension. The hazard ratio goes up to 1.35 for diastolic hypertension to produce future cardiovascular risk. And the diastolic hypertension is more common in, in, the, in patients less than 50 years. Of course, rarely we can have isolated systolic hypertension in the elderly less than 20%, but the pathology is different. The isolated systolic hypertension in elderly is because of increase in aortic stiffness and increase in central aortic pressure. Whereas aortic systole, isolated systolic hypertension in the young is because of increase in pulse, pulse wave amplification from the periphery rather than the stiffening of aorta where the central aortic pressure is normal in the young. So that's why the pathology of systolic hypertension is different and it is much less when compared to the diastolic hypertension when we consider hypertension in the young. And next is how to approach the diagnosis and risk stratification of a patient in a, with a young hypertensive. So the most important clinical examination is to get the correct blood pressure recording. For that, we have to follow five rights. Right cuff size, right placement, right position, right preparation, and right performance by the doctor or the paramedics. The five rights should be appropriately followed to get the correct recording of the blood pressure, which is the first prerequisite for managing a patient hypertension young. Of course, in all patients, in addition to clinic measured blood pressure, we must always have an idea about the out of office blood pressure measurement as well as ambulatory BP measurement to rule out white coat and mast hypertension. Because many of the young patients nowadays, especially people who are working in the IT industry, may have mast hypertension where the blood pressure in the clinic is normal, but the blood pressure in working place may be high. Now we have lot of symptoms in hypertension right from head to foot, starting from headache, the irritability, visual disturbances, epistaxis, the snoring, red face, erectile dysfunction, claudication, and so on. But we must realize no symptom is specific for hypertension. That's why the hypertension is called the silent killer. The excessive blood pressure like 200 bar 100 may exist without any symptoms. So we started the history taking from the head. We have to clinically examine the patient from foot. So we have start from the pulse of the lower limb and also for the gout increase in uric acid. We look for edema, which is pitting and non-pitting due to heart failure, kidney failure, as well as the hypothyroidism and tendon xanthomas for associated familiar hypercholesterolemia. Varicose veins may precipitate postural hypotension. Femoral pulse is for diagnosing coactation of iota. Urinary bladder disturbances for a patient who has a just an increase in the bladder distension it itself can have high blood pressure when he comes to the clinic. And of course, the abdomen for ascites in renal disease and heart failure, aortic aneurysm and mid-segment obesity, which is the important cause of hypertension. And of course, the kidneys should be palpated and auscultated for polycystic kidney and renal artery stenosis. And we must always look at, uh, look at the pulse rate, bradycardia or tachycardia, irregular or irregular in the form of atrial fibrillation, asymmetry of pulses, just like in peripheral vascular disease or iota arteritis. And of course, you must examine the heart for target organ disease, like left ventricular hypertrophy and signs of LV dysfunction, and the lungs for the pulmonary venous congestion, interstitial lung disease, which can be caused by some of the antihypertensives, and of course, associated bronchial asthma. And the neck is a very important area to be examined, thyroid, the carotid brui, the collar size tells you about obstructive sleep apnea and JVP, and the eyes are important for hypertensive retinopathy, dendron xanthomas, and of course, on the brain, 
we have to look for CVA and uh, the VBI. And of course, we must examine the back for collaterals and mummers. So the basic clinical examination itself gives you a lot of clues regarding the causes, secondary causes or essential hypertension. The basic investigation you are supposed to do is glucose, complete blood count, repeat profile. Serum creatinine with EGFR is a very important thing today. And calcium, thyroid stimulating hormone, Urine analysis, we always believe that electrocardiogram and echocardiogram are routine basic testing, uric acid and urine all women creatine ratio. And of course, whenever you have an young hypertensive, there are a lot of clinical clues to suspect secondary hypertension. One, any difficult to control hypertension, onset of hypertension before 30 years, fluctuating blood pressure, abrupt onset of hypertension, suddenly the blood pressure is getting out of control, unprovoked or excessive hypokalemia after diuresis may tell you primary hyperaldosteronism, accelerated or malignant hypertension in any hypertensive crisis, disproportionate the target organ disease to the degree of hypertension, the cardication in young patients, unexplained anemia and hypertension may give a clue about chronic kidney disease, the daytime sleepiness or tiredness may tell you obstructive sleep apnea and must always go through the drugs the patient is taking, which may be the cause of hypertension. So these are the clinical clues to suspect a secondary hypertension. Once you suspect a secondary hypertension, regarding the age, there are certain common secondary causes. In child or adolescent, it can be renal parenchymal disease or coactation of iota. So the investigation likely to be ruin analysis, urine culture, and renal ultrasound, and of course, echocardiography. In young hypertensives, it is thyroid dysfunction is the commonest cause, renal artery stenosis, due to fibromuscular dysplasia. So when you do a CT angiograph, thyroid function test, and of course, the hyperaldosteronism, obstructive sleep apnea, Cushing syndrome and pheochromocytoma, we have to look for renin and aldosterone levels, thyroid function test, sleep studies, and Cushing's for 24-hour urinary-free cortisol, and of course, urinary-free, urinary fractionated metanephrines for pheochromocytoma. So according to the age, we have to suspect that important secondary causes. According to that, we have to investigate the patient for a secondary hypertension. Then we come to how to manage a patient uh, with hypertension and yang. There are five important goals. One is to detect and confirm hypertension in the yang. Second is individual treatment of secondary cause of hypertension if present. And of course, detection and reversal of target organ disease and control of other risk factors other than hypertension to reduce overall cardiovascular risk. And of course, you must not forget what are the coexisting conditions and the drugs the patient is taking so that the condition should not worsen the hypertension or the hypertensive drug should not worsen the comorbid conditions. So these are the five goals in the treatment of hypertension in the young. So the lifestyle modification is very, very important. Today, the IT lifestyle is the main cause of hypertension in the young. The patient, the, the people are not uh, exercising, working continuously, time-related goals, and lot of substance abuse lot of soft drinks, smokings, and of course, continuous monitoring of uh, continuous watching the TV or the monitors and no exercise with a mixed sudden obesity. And the most important thing is the lifestyle modification. As I mentioned, the risk scores are not very good for the uh, uh, assessing the risk in hypertension young. The only risk score now today is called two risk three, which actually includes those people between 25 to 84 years to assess the risk of hypertension in the young. So this is my algorithm to treat hypertension in the young. It's only practical, it's not from the guideline. So basically we have to use A or B in young hypertensives, angiotensin inhibitors or the beta blockers, and of course, plus calcium channel blockers as a low dose. And because many of the guidelines now come with the combination of low dose combination as the initial choice of therapy itself. So the low dose means half of the original dose. So either aldosterone inhibitor, angiotensin inhibitor, like AC inhibitor, ARB, or a beta blocker, low dose. BP not a target, go for full dose of these two drugs. If the BP is still not controlled with ARB plus C, add a diuretic in the third step. Still the BP is not under control, rule out apparent resistant hypertension. That is, you have to rule out pseudo-resistant causes such as the, as you have to do the all-stress maneuver to rule out pseudo-hypertension, white coat hypertension, and so on. If the pseudo-resistant causes are excluded, then it becomes a true resistant hypertension. Then you reevaluate for secondary causes. Use spinolactone if the potassium is less than 4.5 and heart rate is less than 70, 
alpha blocker if the potassium is more than 4.5 and heart rate is less than 70 and clonidin if the potassium is more than 4.5 and the heart rate is 70. So this is how we can approach a hypertension in the young by starting with a low dose combination, then building up and going into resistant hypertension and so on. So next question comes, which AC inhibitor, in which situation I've used AC inhibitor or ARB? The preferred AC inhibitors are ramipril and perindopril, ARB is telmisartan and valsartan. So in which situation we start first with A, males, diabetics, presence of albumin, LVH, heart rate less than 70 or bradyarrhythmia, LV dysfunction who are wet or the unstable heart failures, bronchial asthma, erectile dysfunction and peripheral vascular disease, we must start on the first uh, drug will be AC inhibitor or ARB. In those people, in which people will start beta blocker plus calcium channel blockers, beta blockers will be bisoprolol and nebibilol. Pregnancy and pregnancy eligible females where we cannot use AC inhibitor and ARB, increased sympathetic activity, anxiety, increased creatinine and potassium, bilateral atrocinosis, coronary heart disease, LV dysfunction who are stable, dry patients, and tachyarrhythmias, where we start B as the first group of drugs. And the preferred drugs of calcium channel blockers will be ablodipine, benedipine, and ifedipine long-acting, especially in pregnancy, in diuretics, such as indapamide, chlorthyridone, loop diuretics if GFR is low. Of course, we have to treat the secondary causes and don't miss a curable hypertension. But what I'm trying to say is, in which are the drugs you must avoid in particular secondary causes? Atinolol should be avoided in CKD, in renal artery stenosis, AC inhibitor, ARB, in absolute sleep apnea, it is beta blocker and sedatives. In primary hyperaldosteronism, it should be thiazides and loop diuretics should be avoided. And alcohol, when the patient is taking alcohol, they must be stopped and reduced. And avoid NICDs and COX-2 inhibitors. In pheochromocytoma, we must avoid beta blockers as the first group of drugs. In hypothyroidism, we must avoid beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. They produce bradycardia here and they produce edema here. In hyperthyroidism, we must avoid calcium channel blockers and alpha blockers because they produce tachycardia. In Cushing's, we must avoid beta blockers because they will increase the weight. In hyperparathyroidism, the thiazides may be uh, contraindicated because of hypercalcemia. To conclude my talk and give a takeaway, so young onset of hypertension is not rare. Hypertension, the young is going to have a hypertension in middle age and elderly age, and it can produce cardiovascular brain and uh, brain changes not only in the middle age, in the young age itself. So it is going to produce excessive cardiovascular risk in middle age. The problem is guidelines are not concentrating in this group and risk calculators are not available. The investigations depends upon what type of secondary hypertension you are suspecting and the treatment algorithm I have told you, better to start with A or, a or B with C and then increase the dose and add a diuretic and go on. So with this, I conclude my talk by telling you the hypertension in the young is not rare. That diagnosis is difficult. The decision regarding therapy is difficult. The males and females may have a different approach and the drugs are different. And the important thing is you have to avoid all these target organ diseases in future by appropriately diagnosing young hypertension and treating them properly and also motivating them to adhere to the drugs, increasing the compliance and adherence. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, sir, for your excellent deliberation and excellent talk. As we are running more than one hour late, so at this moment, we are not taking any questions. After the session of all the speakers, we'll take questions one by one. So with this, thank you, sir, again. Uh, our next speaker is...